The Parthenon is an ancient Greek temple to the goddess Athena, built over 2,400 years ago. Join me in this video as I climb up the Acropolis to visit it for myself. But unfortunately, as you'll see, I got pickpocketed when I got there and I got into a pretty angry rage as a result. Let's go. So, the Panathenaic Stadium, within a capacity of about 50,000 people, was first built around 360 BC in limestone, but then it was rebuilt in marble in the 140s AD, and now it's the only stadium in the world built entirely of marble. It had a record attendance of 80,000 people once. Basically like an amphitheater or a coliseum or something like that for the games but Greek instead of Roman, obviously. Hence the flags. You blocking my path, little man? That's right. That's what I thought. You stay in your lane, boy. The Temple of Olympian Zeus. Greetings. This is the Olympion. It was one of the biggest temples in the world, and it was a temple for the king of the gods, Zeus. I'm on my way today, and in this video, I'm gonna climb up the Acropolis, braving the huge throngs of crowds of tourists from around the world to get to the top and appreciate the old temple of Athena up on top. The Parthenon. I'm also going to have a look in the museum and look at some of the better artifacts in there uh, from the Parthenon. But on the way, I couldn't go past the Olympion without having a look. This is a really interesting place because it was started so long ago in the 6th century BC, a really long time ago. But they, the Athenians, when they started getting into democracy and stuff, they thought it would be hubris to build such a big temple. And so they just sort of gave up on it, left it unfinished. Then it was started again, like I think the second century BC for a while, but it didn't actually get finished in, until much later, until the reign of Emperor Hadrian. So when this time, this whole place was under Roman rule at the time, it was the Romans who finished it, even though the Romans under Sulla had uh, earlier sacked and damaged it, but, um, and taken some of the columns away to, to Rome. Uh, for a temple of Jupiter there. Jupiter, Zeus is the same thing, just different names. Roman and Greek uh, mythology and religion, pretty similar, uh, because the Romans just rewrote their religion to match that of the Greeks, because they were such greek -aboos, they couldn't resist it. But uh, this whole place got sacked uh, in the 200s by a Germanic tribe called the Heruli. They took Athens and they did it, uh, they, did, they did it nasty. And they damaged this temple severely and it was left in a ruin ever since, uh, except for the columns that you see here. They really took the whole city of Athens uh, and they um, came in from the Balkans and they, uh, the, the city was ser seriously reduced in size as a result uh, until, until they were driven out of the city, but the damage was already done. But yeah. Uh, I can't imagine how much damage these Germanic tribes could have done to such an enormous temple. It was, yeah, I think the biggest temple of the gods in the world. Um, but yeah, still quite amazing. Shame there's a scaffold on it, but yeah, that's about all I'm gonna say on that matter. So I'll head towards the Parthenon now. And I gotta show you this incredible view through this arch on the way up. I'll get a decent shot with the other camera. If I could go back to 267 AD, I'd like to ask one of those Haruli Teutonic tribesmen what they hoped to achieve by smashing up this temple. I'm not just saying that, I really 
am curious because obviously the reason they like to sack places is to steal the wealth, take it with them, enrich themselves in the process. They did not profit by smashing up marbles. Uh, so why do they do it? I don't know. I mean, we know why Muslims do that sort of thing and Christians do that sort of thing, because their religion requires them to, you know, smash up pagan temples. But why would the Haruli have done it? I don't know. Um, maybe they just thought it's a lot of fun to smash up marbles, that, like columns and stuff. I have to give it a try myself to see what all the fuss is about. I've never tried it. These ones are in a sorry state. I'm not sure if any of these ruins uh, the, uh, were smashed up by the Haruli themselves or by subsequent uh, incomers. Many iconoclasts have come to Greece over the years. The Ottomans, the Christians. But uh, it's a curious thing, isn't it? What, uh, maybe they just really hated Greeks and they just wanted to smash it because it was Greek. Um, but if that was the case, why did they hate the Greeks so much? I mean, uh, or was it because they hated the Romans because of the Romans incursions into Germanic land and they just thought these are like Romans so we need to get revenge? That would explain it. That would explain it, I suppose. If you know the answer or you have any insights, please let me know in the comments. Someone based just knocked the nose off this a uh, socialist feminist woman who slandered the British Empire and slandered Elgin. Uh, she was the one who started this movement in the 70s saying that uh, the British stole the Elgin marbles, which is uh, not true. It's, not, it's simply untrue. But the, uh, I mean, I agree that the, it would be nice if the Elgin marbles were back here in Greece. Uh, but if they come back, it has to be because they were bought back, because they were purchased legitimately and legally. And uh, if they were given back, it wouldn't be to return them. It would be a gift from Britain. Uh, and uh, the British Museum can't afford that. So uh, if the Greeks want them, I think they should pay the equivalent price that the British Museum paid for them, which, by the way, is significantly less than what Elgin paid to have them brought there. But that's Elgin's problem. Never mind that. Um, but yeah, this woman was a lefty, uh, a very popular a cult here now today. Um, but uh, obviously someone's knocked her nose off. I can see a kind of iconoclasm that uh, I can get behind. I'm switching to the lapel mic now, so I'm just gonna be monologuing. No need to get any other audio. But what's my controversial view on the Elgin marbles? Look, I'm not one of those people who's saying that you know Brits should be allowed to steal things and keep them, whatever. It's not that. It's and I, I don't I completely sympathize with the Greeks when they say they believe that the Parthenon marbles, as they call them, the Elgin marbles, belong in the original setting. That's true, I think they do, and they should go back there one day, but the way they came to be in Britain is completely not understood by a lot of Greek people. That's just like, and a lot of people in America as well who get fed this sort of false narrative. When the, Elgin was the ambassador for the Ottoman Empire at a time when Napoleon was in charge of most of Europe and was stealing stuff all over Europe and Egypt, bring it to France, and Britain wanted to also enrich itself in this way. And, uh, well, some British people did. Elgin was a Scottish man who wanted to enrich Britain culturally, and we British people have, you know, for hundreds of years been enamored with the Greeks, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, uh, as, a, you know, the source of our own culture in a way, our higher culture. Um, all the aristocrats always spoke Greek and Latin. Uh, and uh, he was given a permit to take sculptures from the Parthenon the, by the Ottomans. So and they were legally in charge of this area. You can say that you know, they were a colonial force or whatever. True, they were, they were but you know, so were the Greeks, so were the Romans. And uh, they were in charge. 
and Britain had, well, the Elgin had this uh, legal right, and he paid out of his own pocket a lot of money to have the marbles removed from the Parthenon and transported to Britain. And he didn't get that money back. He was sold into the British Museum at a severely discounted rate because they they recognized the British Museum. Some people criticized Elgin at the time. People in Britain weren't entirely happy about what he was doing because they were saying, okay, it's good that you want to enrich British culture, but what about the Greeks? Aren't you taking away from that? But the, um, the British Museum determined that they had been acquired legally, which they had. They were not stolen, they were acquired legally. And um, they agreed to buy them, but only at a rate that, uh, you know, was not agreeable to Elgin. I mean, not fair to Elgin. So he lost a lot of money. British Museum got them, and they've been there ever since. The British Museum has protected them quite well. Um, <laughs> many things have been damaged here. Uh, you know, this temple, of Athena has subsequently been used as a church and then later as a mosque. And at one point, the Ottomans even stored gunpowder inside and the Venetians attacking the place uh, caused that gunpowder to blow up, damaging a lot of the stuff inside. So it's a great thing that the British protected the, um, the marbles in a way. And uh, even that, um, feminist woman, she, who, uh, she even says, you know, thank you. She said, thank you for the British for protecting our marbles, but now we want them back. Well, we were protecting them, true, but not just for the Greeks. We were protecting them for the world, that anyone in the world can go into the British Museum and see them for free. They don't cost anything, and they're in the context of, you know, riches from around the world, not just from Britain or Greece, from every culture. What you can't say is that the British nicked them because we never nicked them. In fact, and the British Empire or British government wasn't involved in their acquisition anyway. It was just a private Scottish citizen who did it out of his own pocket. Uh, and you can't say that it would have been better if he didn't do that because they probably wouldn't exist anymore. If they, do, if they did, either they would have been pillaged by the French or someone else, or they would have just been destroyed. They might have been uh, taken down by Greeks and then sold to private collectors and they may have disappeared in the process that almost certainly wouldn't be as well preserved as they are now if the British, British hadn't acquired them. So, you know, I don't think the British have any, there's no fault. However, despite that, I think it's good that the British should <laughs> offer to sell them back to the Greeks. The Greeks have enough money to build in 2009 an enormous museum to house the contents of the Parthenon. Uh, marbles and things like that, and they're hoping to get the ones back from Britain and put them in there. I hope they spared some money to buy them, then, because I don't see why they should get them for free uh, when it was the British money that has protected them for so long. Um, but yeah, it's perfectly reasonable to want them back, but it's not reasonable to slander the British in the way that they so frequently are. Okay, let us continue the ascent. There's quite a lot of people here. I've seen people from all over the world. I can hear Japanese, Spanish, American accents, all sorts of things. I wonder whether in ancient times, as people ascended the Acropolis to get to the Parthenon, they had a spiritual experience of the sort that Evola describes of, uh, in mountain climbing, where the ascent physical ascent is likened to a spiritual ascent of, a, of the spirit as they go up. Spectacular views. Whew. Lovely and hot here. Uh -huh. A monument for a Syrian prince, they say. I consider Athena, Pallas Athena, or as the Romans called her, Minerva, to be equivalent to our god, our goddess Freya, who is also a war goddess, like Athena. Athena also had the aspect of being associated with wisdom. 
And I suppose Freya also has that in a way because of her association with Saeedr, the, uh, the magic of uh, women, which is associated with spirit travel and weaving. With all these great crowds, it reminds me somewhat of a pilgrimage site, even today. Well, these aren't pilgrims, the tourists, but I suppose there's got to be some crossover, even in ancient times, when people go into things just for um, pilgrimage to make offerings. There's also a kind of thing that they can boast about Sylvia. having visited this site, much like a tourist would as well. Oh. Oh. Hope the wind's not too bad on the mic. Sorry about that if it is. Beth, stay there. Stay I'll try and cover it with my hand. Huh. If you ever do come here, I recommend you wear your walking shoes. Flip-flops not ideal. I've got some decent sandals on, luckily. Wow. A temple fit for a goddess. What an amazing, imposing structure. They really were masterful architects, those Greeks. I remember in Sri Lanka when I climbed Sri Pada, the holy mountain, sacred to Hindus and also Buddhists. And it's um, similar to this in feeling, like the ascent of going up and at the top they have a little sort of shrine what they call, what's the thing they call Buddha's footprint. I did a video on it, you should check it out if you want to see more. Uh, it's really worth climbing if you're ever in Sri Lanka. But uh, there are massive crowds there going up during holy festivals. The rest of the time is mostly just tourists descending, like here. I went at a time when there were no tourists going up hardly at all because <laughs> Uh, it was very poor visibility that day, but um, there were some Chinese tourists going up, but they weren't really tourist tourists because they were Buddhists and they were, went up to the top and they were praying at the top, so they were pilgrims really. Um, I wonder how many of the tourists who come here have any spiritual respect for the religion that this monument represents and is used for. I haven't seen any evidence of anyone praying. And I haven't come with any offerings, which is impious of me. I should have brought something, but... Oh, just trying to organize my family and stuff before I come up. Gosh. What amazing structure to have stood here for so long. There it is. The Parthenon. Incredible. There must be thousands coming here every day. In two and a half thousand years, how many thousands of people will daily visit the ruins of churches? I've got a feeling not as many. However, to be fair, the ruins of Gothic architecture do look beautiful in their ruined state, with the Gothic arches still surviving. Like you can see in Gotland and places like that, or even Outside Guildford, Waverley Abbey, places like that. I absolutely love Gothic ruins, just as much as the ruins of the Greeks. So, 
But I mean, there's ruins and there's ruins. Like this is on a whole other level. Just the sheer scale of it. It's just very powerful. It's, a, it's an architecture of power. This really shows the Athenians are a force to be reckoned with. Ah, oh, the Caryatids. Near Euston in London, you can see on a church there are sort of mimicked forms of these Caryatids, these women. At this moment, my mic came unplugged. I was going to say that by my old uni in Euston, London, there are similar Caryatids on the Church of St Pancras based on those of this temple called the Erechtheion. The eastern part of the temple was dedicated to the worship of Athena, the patron goddess of the city of Athens, while the western part was dedicated to Poseidon and Hephaestus and other gods. It was the home of Athena's most sacred relic, the Palladium, which was a crude olive wood effigy of the goddess, known as a Zoanon. You can see more Caryatids down in the Acropolis Museum, and there's also one in London. One thing you can't see here is what the Erechtheion or the Parthenon looked like in their original multicoloured glory with all the statuary mounted on them. In Nashville, Tennessee, there is a life-size concrete replica of the Parthenon and you will notice that up on the triangular part on top, which is called the pediment, there were beautiful sculptures of the gods. Many were damaged over the years and today some of them are in London while some are in the Acropolis Museum, such as this statue of Dionysus, laid back and chilling out. The Acropolis Museum has this miniature replica of what the pedimental sculpture once looked like. You have to imagine it all painted up in beautiful colours, of course. Interestingly, all the statues were carved perfectly on all sides, even though no human eyes would ever see the rear sides. And this is because they were not made for humans. They were made for the gods who see everything. It was at this time I realised that my pocket had been picked and I said some things that probably ought not to be made public, so it's just as well the mic jack came out and there's no audio. But I did make a little monologue down the hill about getting robbed, so keep watching for that. Excuse me, can I take a shot with your tattoo? Yeah, sure man, this one. Yeah, yeah. Hold up to the Parthenon. This one, like <laughs> yeah. here or? What above, the, above the temple. Yeah. Okay. No. Then I can get... That's cool. You're Greek? No, no, English. Oh, right. It's just fascination with this, but I've got... It's up to you, which one you want? Yeah, <laughs> the Gorgon, Hercules, Farnese, is it? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's cool. Hercules, thank you. You, you might have this on YouTube. No, no, go for it, honestly. No problem. Okay. Cheers, mate. It's alright. Funny thing, I just ran into the, a Minister of Culture for Greece, a guy who works for the Ministry of Culture, and he told me he was very sorry to hear that I was robbed at the Parthenon and that it was almost certainly a gang of immigrants and that there are immigrant gangs who have been, he says, let in by the Turks in recent years, since 2015 in the refugee crisis. I thought it was one of the uh, peoples who have been in the Balkans for a rather longer time and who are also known for pickpocketing, but he assures me that it's more likely one of the more recent arrival of immigrant gangs who have a professional uh, operation at the tourist areas in Greece. Uh, the same sort of immigrants who 
seven, over 70 of which were arrested this year for setting fire to setting fires on the hills around the area are the ones who uh, also rob all the tourists that come here. And these are the ones that the communists spray up. Refugees welcome everywhere. Welcome to come and rob people. Welcome to commit crimes. The first, thing they, the first country they get to when they come to Europe is Greece. And here they pickpocket people. And that's called enrichment.